Okay, keep it going for your next storyteller, Andrew Hines. So this is a story about my teeth. <laughs> so I was, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. So I was 11 years old, uh, the year was 1961. I was in sixth grade, and I was kind of a shy, awkward, weird little kid, actually. I spent a lot of time with my nose in, in books, sitting in corners, uh, never could successfully pay, play a sport. But one day, uh, my class was coming in from recess, and all the boys were in a line, and we're moving from the grass onto the blacktop, and all the boys are kind of pushing each other and laughing, and I decide, for once, I'm going to be a real boy. So I turned to the boy who was next to me in line, and I pushed him. This guy was, uh, the, the kid's name was Bradford. Bradford turned to me with this look of utter and complete glee on his face, and he hauled off and hit me as hard as he could in my tummy. And I felt extreme pain, and then um, I blacked out. I fell forward onto my face, onto the blacktop. When I woke up about a minute or two later, I had knocked out both of my front teeth, and I had blood all over my face. And my family moved away from that little town about a month later, and I hoped I would never see Bradford again in the rest of my life. So I actually grew up to be a, a pretty pissed off kid. <laughs> A lot of people were pissed off in the 1960s, and I was really, really pissed off. <laughs> I was, I hated the war in Vietnam, I hated racial injustice, I hated poverty, I hated rich people generally, and I ended up joining the Revolutionary Communist Party and setting out to overthrow the U.S. government in, a, in the most violent possible way. So I spent several years actually uh, working in steel plants in Birmingham, Alabama, getting arrested a lot and getting beat up by a lot of people who really did not like my politics. <laughs> and I found myself one day in Washington, D.C., in a church basement with a thousand other revolutionaries, getting ready to march to the White House in opposition to U.S. capitalism. And I had been told, we had all been told, you know, the police are going to attack our march. We don't have a permit for this thing. They're going to be attacking the march, so get prepared. So I, along with everybody else, had a billy club in my hand, a red flag attached to the billy club, and I was ready to defend myself. And we emerged from the church basement onto 14th Street. And as I was going up the stairs, I noticed that there was this little side room that I hadn't known about. And there was a group of people in that side room who looked like I could, I could only describe them as having the appearance of an attack squad. They all had great big long pieces of wood, and they were sharing out a set of evil, nasty-looking metal uh, jacks, big metal jacks, that they were planning to throw onto the street in front of the police horses so that the police horses would step on the jacks cripple themselves, maybe fall down and break their legs, the police then would have the perfect excuse to attack us, and we would have the perfect excuse to be morally correct and defend ourselves from the unwanted peace police attack. So I noticed that in the moment, but didn't really take it in. Went up onto the street with all the other revolutionaries, sure enough, the, the attack squad attacked the police. The police attacked back. I ended up in the middle of 14th Street in Washington, D.C. with four Washington, D.C. cops beating on my head with billy clubs. And I woke up a few minutes later, having lost the two plastic front teeth that I had from Bradford, <laughs> as well as five additional real teeth and with my body covered with blood. And I ended up getting 55 stitches in my head. And that moment was the beginning 
of me beginning to reprogram my brain, to think about things in a little bit different way, and to notice that it, it was just a little bit weird to be working to create a world of peace and justice through violent revolution. Maybe there was a different kind of revolution that I needed to be part of. So fast forward another 25 years or so, and it was 1995, and I discovered something brand new in the world. It was a, it was a website called a People Finder website. So you go to this, this website, you, maybe you've never heard of this thing before. You type in somebody's name that you haven't seen in a long time, and pops up their name, and then it gives you some contact information, a phone call, or a phone number to call. And obviously then, I typed in the name of the only person in the world that I never wanted to see in the rest of my life. And it happened to be Bradford, of course. And Bradford's name popped up, his first name, last name. It was the same guy, 2,000 miles away. And Bradford lived 10 miles from where I live. And there was a phone number. And I hadn't seen Bradford in 35 years. So quite naturally, before I could back out, I called the phone number. Guy answered the phone, and I said, uh, this is Andy Himes, and I'm just wondering if this is the same Bradford who attended Holmes Elementary School in Wheaton, Illinois? And he said, Andy, is that you? I can't believe it. This is amazing. I have been waiting all my life to say how sorry I am for what I did to you. He said, that day changed my life. I made a pledge that I would never ever hit anybody in the rest of my life, and I've kept that promise. He said, when I, when I grew up, it was the Vietnam War, I joined the Navy to, avo to avoid the draft into the Army, but when I was in boot camp in the Navy, I went up to the lieutenant and I said, I can't do this, I can never carry a gun, I cannot be associated with any organization that will do any damage to another human being. So I can't do this. So they made, they made me write a big, heavy, a big complicated essay explaining my feelings, and they, they let me out of the Navy, and I had to work in a hospital for a couple of years during the Vietnam War. But I want to tell you, Andy, I am so grateful that you called me to give me a chance to tell you how sorry I am for what I did to you. So here's the thing. Bradford, when he was 11 years old, he came face to face with this fundamental contradiction between his deepest values and his actions in the world. It took me another several decades and five more teeth <laughs> to learn the same thing that Bradford figured out when he was 11 years old. So Bradford, wherever you are in the world tonight, I want to thank you for being my teacher. <laughs>